Lu am Skoldi, Silke Wilsonness, Emma Sat Gutsa. Skold and Gitna Toyex are Samogat Lahagi, Will Gitna Dam Ama Sablo. Melissa Schwab, Wilts Wizen, We Built Weekwe, Sim Gasgasmi, Get Let Damix Will Dee Weekwe, Get Damix Will Joy. So in the language of the Niska people, and I apologize for my accent, I'm still trying to, or just starting to relearn my language, I said, I'm happy to be with you all on this good day. First, I give my thanks and honor to the Creator for giving us this day, and I want to give my thanks and honor to you all. My name is Melissa. I come from the house of Wisdom We Built. I'm a member of the Killer Whale Tribe from the community of Get Back Bamix, and I live, work, and play in Vancouver on the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh peoples. And I want to acknowledge and thank them for allowing us to do our business on their territory today. So I'm going to start with some context, because I'm an archivist by training, and archivists really like context. We like context, and we like theory. But I'll try and keep the theory fairly light. <laughs> um, we're coming up on Canada's 150th birthday, and let's face it, for the majority of those 150 years, um, there have been policies and actions taken to prevent and keep Indigenous people from existing as Indigenous people including deliberate efforts to destroy indigenous knowledge systems, such as removal of Aboriginal children, limiting access to territory, and banning of ceremonies. And libraries and archives aren't neutral in this. They supported institutions and governments that carried out these activities, and records exist because indigenous people existed to become the subjects of those records. Plus, how libraries and archives go about doing their work has been shaped by the views of the society which, of which they are a part. So things like classifying and describing and defining, as well as say, deciding what the kind of legitimate uh, content and form of records and information should take, and the continuing control over this information um, has impacted and continues to impact and marginalize indigenous peoples, their worldviews, and their knowledge systems. Which isn't to say that indigenous people are somehow separate from libraries and archives. I don't want to get into a binary situation because we definitely do make use and create our own records and make use of existing libraries and archives for our information needs. Um, but it doesn't mean that we can't do this in a way that um, includes our protocols and perspectives. And where libraries and archives certainly aren't the only institutions facing this issue. What I have up here is a quote from Verna Kirkness and Ray Barnhard, um, who you may know from Verna Kirkness from UBC who are, in this quote, are talking about the relationship between universities and indigenous students and the challenges there. And what I've done in this quote is take out the word university and replace it with libraries and archives, and take out the word students and replace it with people. So now it reads, from the vantage point of the library and archives, people are generally viewed as coming to partake of what the library and archives has to offer. From this perspective, it is presumed that the library and archives is an established institution with its own non-standing, deeply rooted policies, practices, programs, and standards to serve the needs of the society in which it is embedded. People who come to the library and archives are expected to adapt to its modus operandi if they wish to obtain the benefits. I think it's time that libraries and archives should be doing some adapting too. <laughs> so Kirkness and Barnhart suggest four concepts that can provide guidance in this work. Respect for indigenous cultural integrity, so we have our own ways of knowing. Relevance to indigenous perspectives and experiences. We have a colonial history and the present which has affected us and must be addressed. Reciprocity and relationships. Relationships are meant to be reciprocal. Each party can learn from the other. And also relationships are ongoing and must be maintained. 
and responsibility through participation. Indigenous people must be able to exercise responsibility, responsibility and meaning, meaningfully participate at all levels of the institution. Okay, great, but how, what can this actually mean in practice? So I'll give some examples from the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. The union was founded in 1969 to be a voice, a collective voice for BC First Nations. So the idea that we are stronger if we work together. And we were founded in response to the previous Trudeau government's white paper, basically an assimilationist document. The Resource Center was established in the early 1970s, so soon after our founding. Um, primarily, currently, we are there to serve land claims research, but we do a bunch of other stuff as well, which maybe will come out in the discussion afterwards. Um, we collect, disseminate, and preserve information and aim to make key resources more accessible. So we have books, our primary, we have about 14,000 volumes, I think, with primarily indigenous and environmental focuses. We have subject files, copies of archival documents from other institutions and serials, which mainly focus on indigenous law and BC history. We also have a gallery space in institutional archives, and yes, we have a backlog, um, digital collections online microforms, maps, digitization equipment, and we offer reference support as well as opportunities for um, internships and professional experience to library and archive students. And uh, we do advocacy work as well. Okay. Up here, I've just got a couple of examples from our collection that we have put online. The first is um, from one of the, the union's newspapers. It's from 19... 81, and what it is, is an article about um, indigenous women occupying the Indian Northern Affairs offices in Vancouver. And they were doing this because of youth suicide, poor housing conditions on reserve, effects of residential school, and the paternalistic attitude of the government. Um, and you may recall that earlier this year, Indigenous women and children were occupying the same regional offices for the same reasons. And like I said, this was 1981, this article was from. And the photograph is from a protest against the removal of Aboriginal children from communities. Um, you can see one of the signs there says, Stop Stealing Our Children. And it's still the same issues that we're dealing with today. So it's important to have important and frustrating to have resources available to know our history. Um, and I really admire the people who are continuing to work on these issues and the strength and resilience. A uh, few other things we do to try to incorporate or address indigenous needs and perspectives. We have an ethical research policy that's available on our website. And basically it recognizes that research can harm as well as help indigenous people. So if you want to use our services, you, our facilities and resources, you have to be to abide by it. We have endorsed the protocols for Native American archival materials, both um, as a library and archives itself, but also the union as a whole has done that. And how many librarian and archivist type people do we have? today. <laughs> so, okay, I'm going to talk about classification. So, <laughs> um, we do use our uh, Brian Deere classification, which was developed by a Mohawk librarian in the 19th, Brian Deere in the 1970s, um, rather than something like Library of Congress or Dewey Decimal, just because there's a lot more meaningful and less offensive than some other library classification systems. Um, so we have things like we try to use names nations call themselves and where they are geographically is where they sit next to each other on the shelf just so it's easier for browsing um, and then we also have um, classifications that yeah like I said are more meaningful and useful so we have one for indigenous response resilience and survival and I just I love that we have that as a classification code. <laughs> We also do things like if we make material available, we try to respect the 
the um, nation from which we bought it. So this actually we have it's what to, in 1975 one of our our big meetings jury we digitized some of that meeting and put it online. But part of what we digitized actually included a welcoming song um, from a nation and. Um, actually, we, I think we screwed this up a little bit because we put it online and then the nation came to us and said, no, you shouldn't be doing that. So now when you go to look at this digitized film, you see that this message that this cultural lady sent us information that's been removed and so you have three or four minutes of that in the film instead of the song that was originally there. Okay, I am almost at the end of my time, so I'm just going to point out that um, there are other people and groups that are working on issues related to indigenous materials. So um, maybe I'll make my PowerPoint available afterwards so people can see the list of stuff that's out there. Um, because, yeah, sometimes the library in archives field feels kind of monolithic, but there are people working to address issues and changes. And, things and people who have been thinking about this. So I'll make these resources more available, maybe tweet out some people that I follow on Twitter and other links to resources. Oh, and just really quickly again, like we're not doing this in isolation. So some other groups that are working on cool stuff related to Indigenous archives. The Indigitization Grant Program at UBC. Um, one of the nice things about that is they don't require the material that it's um, they provide grants and training to indigenous communities for digitizing their material. And one of the things they do is not require that the community then make that material public. <coughs> but there are great programs. Um, the Association of Federal Archives, <coughs> Libraries, and Museums brings all, recognizes that the information we're seeking is all, in all sorts of sources, so it doesn't silo archives, libraries, and museums. And the Makudu Collection Management System actually has labels that communities can apply to say that this material, for example, could only be viewed at certain times of the year, or, um, is, yeah, they have interesting labels. I won't get into too much more of that since I'm at the end, so thank you. Um, there I am on Twitter. I tweet a lot about indigenous information stuff. And also pictures of cats and things. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>